if you have a Bible, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 27 and 28. And I'm going to read almost the entire, both chapters in its entirety. We're going to get to that in, in just a moment. We're going to walk you through what I mean by that. You're going to be able to follow on the screens and, and follow my notes as we work through this. But as we look at Easter, and we never know who's viewing, either right now live online or, or later, right? It, whether through on demand. And we, we pray that as you view this, that you understand this. Like if you're like, man, I really wanted to gather for Easter and I was hoping to go somewhere. Um, I told my grandma I'd go to church. Well, you still get to tell grandma you went to church. You're going to do it right now and going to walk through us with this. Here's what I want you to understand about Easter and the story. And I want to be very clear about what type of Jesus we're looking at. I want to be very clear this morning what it means to have faith in Christ and what does that mean. For some of you, there, there may be in different types of Jesus. Maybe when you were growing up, you had what I call maybe Elmer's glue Jesus. Elmer's glue Jesus is, is camp Jesus. Maybe you know it as vacation Bible school. Maybe you were dropped off at a church um, you know, for free child care kind of a thing back when you were a little one. And whether you went to vacation Bible school, we here call it adventure camp. But again, I'm traveling back years and maybe you just weren't really sure, did that Jesus stick? Like you remember making the crafts, you remember something of the stories, and, uh, but you're not even really sure. Like you have what, what I call an Elmer's glue Jesus. It's, it's a craft Jesus. He was, he was something that you did while a story was being told when you were a young child, and now you're not really sure what that means. Maybe you grew a little older in, in the years and somebody invited you to a camp. And you went away to a camp, whether it was another destination or whether it was a three-day weekend. But you went to what we would call student camp, middle, middle school, high school. You went away to camp. Maybe you got Camp Jesus, right? Uh, when I was growing up, the popular thing to do was, was if you were confessing faith in Christ, you grabbed a stick and you went and you threw that stick in the fire. And, and I'm looking around and everybody's grabbing sticks and everybody's throwing sticks in the fires. And I thought, well, maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe you grew up with Camp Jesus, Maybe you thought, you know, I really can use some improvement. You know, my life's really not where it needs to be. And so, sure, I'll take this stick and throw it in the fire. But even from that moment, you really don't feel any closer to God. You really don't feel any closer to Jesus. Maybe you, fully don't under, you don't fully understand what the story of Easter is. You have what I call Camp Jesus. Maybe there are some, and it happens around this time of the year, not making fun of you, not picking on you, but those are who I want to talk to this morning. And maybe you have Holiday Jesus. Maybe you only show up at, at Christmas. Maybe you only show up at Easter. Maybe you feel like faith is for women and children only. Maybe you feel like faith is for the weak. And so therefore you just kind of go when it's sort of the holiday season. Maybe when you're in the mood or when you're in the spirit. Sort of two times a year. What we call the CEO Christian. The Christmas, Easter and other type of believer. Whether you've had Elmer's glue Jesus. Whether you've had camp Jesus. Or whether you've got holiday Jesus. I really want you to lovingly hear me say this. You need a life-changing version of Jesus. Not just a Jesus that makes crafts. Not just a Jesus that motivates you to throw a stick in the fire and hope that you don't do those things again. What you need is a life-changing version of Jesus. Not just a Jesus that comes around tw twice a year and reminds you, oh yeah, I think I need a little bit of that faith thing in my life. What you need is an absolute life-changing version of Jesus Christ. And that is the story of Easter. You see, we don't believe that Jesus died just because somebody said it. We don't believe that Jesus died and rose again just because we read it. We don't believe that Jesus died and rose again because maybe uh, our faith tells us we should have a service that we call Easter. I want to walk you through historically. We believe that Jesus literally, bodily, physically rose from the dead. That is absolutely what we believe. And here's why we believe it. Because of when we read in the Bible, Matthew and John and Mark and James and Luke and Paul, we believe it because of those guys, yes. But here's why we believe it. We believe it because Matthew writes about it. Mark, Luke, John, what we call the gospel writers. We believe it because the half-brother of Jesus, James. I've preached a sermon on that before if you've paid attention what would it take for you to convince your sister or your brother that you're the Savior, right? And for this guy to come out and write an entire book that basically says, here's what I saw in the life of Jesus Christ, and here's what it means to live a life of faith. He was the Savior, and this is what it looks like. We believe it because of James. We believe it because of the writings of Paul. And here in just a moment, you're going to see that we believe it because of the centurions that were at the cross. 
We believe it because of Mary and Martha. But I want to look this morning at, at, at what I call the, the Easter story. The, the, here's what you need to know about the Easter story. The ending of the Gospels came as a surprise. The, the ending of the story came as a surprise to everyone. Because they weren't expecting this. Now, if you've been with us over the last three or four weeks in the story of Jesus leading up to the Easter moment, the disciples really didn't understand the words that Jesus was saying. Jesus three times foretold of his death and said, I, I need to go to Jerusalem and there I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be imprisoned. I'm going to be falsely accused. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to, I'm going to be buried. But I will come out of the grave. I will come alive. And they, they didn't understand that. You see, not only was Christ a wanted man, but they were wanted men because they were followers of him. And they're like, no, no, now's not the time to go to Jerusalem. We're, we're not going to do this. And so when he ends up going to Jerusalem and, and they, they gather together for the Lord's Supper, and then they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the events that he's speaking takes place, none of them are expecting this. As a matter of fact, this is not at all what they wanted. If they could have scripted a story, they would not have written this. Which is why these courageous men and faithful men at that moment, they didn't gather around him, they scattered from him. Not one disciple was seen at the foot of the cross. Peter was outside the court denying who Jesus Christ was. None of them expected this. The ending to this story came as a surprise to everyone. But I want you to watch how this happens. So on Friday, I want you to see this. On Friday, literally, here's what we know. On Friday, watch, the world shook. I preached the message on, on Good Friday. The title of it was the, the Word That Shook the World. And that one word was tetelestai. In, in the Greek language, it's one word. To you and I, um, it's, it's a number of words. It's three. It is finished. But to them, it's one word when he spoke it. That one word shook the world because as soon as Jesus Christ said those words, the Bible records that an earthquake happened. When he said, it is finished, the earth shook, and at that moment, even the centurions at the foot of the cross confessed. Now listen, the, the Easter resurrection had not even happened yet. But they believed in him so much because on Friday, listen, on Friday, the world was absolutely shook. I love the song we just sang. I love all the songs we just sang. The worship team absolutely in spirit and everything just perfectly portrayed and sung the message of Easter, but I will build my life on you because my life will not be shaken. The reason why our faith will not be shaken now is because the world was shook when Jesus Christ created that one word and said that one word, it is finished. But watch how this thing evolves. On Friday, the world was shook. Have you ever thought about what happened on Saturday? Most of us celebrate Sunday. But think about Saturday for, for me for just a moment. The world was absolutely shaken Friday, the world was shook, but on Saturday, the world was shaken. He was buried, buried in the tomb. You see it, lying in grave clothes. Watch this, motionless. It's almost like the world stood still. The disciples were absolutely shaken. Even though Jesus conveyed to them, here's what's going to happen, and in three days, I'm going to come alive. Because they didn't understand this, they couldn't predict it. That This is not the way the story should have played out in their mind. Everything about what they had given their life to, this man, Jesus Christ, and all their hopes and dreams, on Saturday, the whole world was absolutely shaken. Here he was, motionless, lying still in his grave clothes. He had not come back to life. He was buried. He was buried in the tomb. Our world was absolutely shaken. Haven't you seen just how fragile our world is? This happened in an instant with one word. The Bible records that at that moment the rock split and an earthquake happened. The Bible even records that, that it, it actually opened up the tombs of those who were faithful. And they began walking around and, and testifying to who Christ was. This is before the resurrection happened, all on that one word. But we've seen how in just a matter of days our world can be shaken. Almost like time stands still. We use a term now that's called the new normal. Like, this is the new normal. Like, the world needs a way to define what's happening right now. This is not the new normal for us. The new normal was absolutely redefined when Jesus Christ came out of the grave and said, I 
am alive. This is the reason for Easter, but stay with me. On Friday, here's what we know. On Friday, the world was shook to tell us die. On Saturday, the world was absolutely shaken. But watch Sunday. When Sunday came, the world was shaking. I need you to see this. I, I, I don't know how many times I've preached Easter messages, right? I've been in, preaching now for right at 30 years, so a lot. I don't know how many times I've, I've preached and read this message, and not just during Easter, but I've, how many times I've read this text, and I've never seen, been called to attention, how many times the word earthquake and shaken and shaking is used. That's why we're using these terms, shook, shaken, and shaking. Because here's what we know happened on Sunday. What we know is Easter. He's alive. The angels descend and an earthquake happens around his tomb. The angel appears. The stone is rolled back. The tomb is empty. Here's what we have. I want you to notice this. Here's what we have. We have nervous leaders. We have terrified followers. We have dependent women and confused soldiers. The world is absolutely shook. Shaken and shaking. Two earthquakes happen. Multiple times the, the word shake or shooken, shaken is, 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 is a, a mentioned here in the scriptures in the Easter story. Here's what we know is going on. We have nervous leaders. So on the outside, what's happening around the tomb is, is the religious leaders of the day are, are continuing to have conversations they're constantly giving updates. My phone, your phone, the news is constantly giving us updates on the state of affairs of where we are. This is exactly what's happening. There are constant press conferences happening between the religious leaders and the political establishment. The religious leaders are coming to them and saying, hey, okay, let's, let's make clear. This guy, he's dead, but we, he keeps saying he's going to come back alive and, and his, his, his followers aren't even sure. Uh, but here's what we need. To, we need to put some guards. We need to post guards at the tomb just in case somebody tries to steal the body and then tell us, ha ha, look, he's alive. The, our world is upset. Our world is, we have nervous, leaders. we have terrified followers. They're not going to the tomb. Not one of them is recorded as saying, hey, remember me? No, no one's saying that at that moment. No one is saying, wait, just a few hours ago on a Thursday night, he, this was the third time he told us something like this was going to happen. And wait, we've seen him do these things. Shouldn't one of us believe that maybe, just, just maybe, the man who walked on water, just maybe, the guy that fed the 15,000, just maybe? Am I crazy here? There's not one disciple that ever stood up and said, maybe I'm crazy, but he might just be right. Let's hope that he comes back. No one said, they're terrified. They're denying, they're dispersing. They're hiding out in an upper room. They, they don't know how to respond. They don't know how to react. We have nervous leaders, terrified followers, dependent women. Mary and Martha, they're, they're doing their best to sort of get back to the tomb. And they're, they're gathering all the spices, about 90 pounds worth of spices to go. And they're wondering, like, we don't know what to do now. This man that we followed, he's motionless. He's lying in an empty, in a tomb. He's still wrapped in his grave clothes. What do we do? This is what we know was happening. And, and, of course, even confused soldiers. Listen, we're, we're not here because somebody stole a body. We're not here because somebody wrote some letters. We're not here because somebody died on a cross. We're here because nobody was expecting a resurrection, and it happened. That's why we're here. No one anticipated the ending of the story this way. And the reason why we're here is because those terrified leaders, those, those centurion soldiers that, that came to Christ, that believed in, those, those dependent women, the, 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 those terrified disciples, at the moment they heard that Christ was alive, the church didn't gather, the church scattered and spread the word, and he was seen by over 500 people. We're not here because somebody wrote some letters. We're not here because the Easter bunny showed up. We're not here even because Jesus died on the cross. We're here because he came out of the tomb. We're here because no one was expecting a resurrection, and that's exactly what happened. When the story was not thought to have ended this way, and it came to be that what he said is who he was, and now everything makes sense. What they did not understand before, they now understand because this it's the story of Easter. And this is what you and I have to get to. It's called unshakable faith. On Friday, the world was shook. On Saturday, the world was shaken. Motionless was the tomb. But on Sunday, 
Another earthquake. The angel appeared. The stone was rolled away. And Jesus Christ was already out, by the way. You know that, right? The stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so you could see in that he was, that he was already out. He was already out before the angels appeared, before the stone was rolled away. The angels didn't have to let him out. He was, he was already out. He had already defeated death. You understand? So this is the Easter story. So fast forward with me. I want to look at Easter from the, from the inside to the outside. I want to look at it from, from the tomb out and watch what happens. Here's what we know happened 22 years later. 22 years later. The timeline written of Jesus Christ is unlike any other historical figure we've ever seen. Most folks like Alexander the Great, hundreds of years after his life, then we start writing about him. Only 22 years later, Paul is recorded getting together with the disciples. And we find and we understand that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. Here's what it says. Follow along on the screen. Now, I would remind you, brothers, this is Paul writing, of the gospel I preached to you, which, I, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you. So he's talking about what they delivered. As of first importance, what I also received. So he's referring to this, this sort of convocation that they had together with the disciples like, hey, this was real. Somebody needs to write this down. And here's what we learned. Here's what we took away just days after what we now call Easter. We're going to write this down. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried. That He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And, watch this, that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he, alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is, Jesus appeared. Paul writes, 22 years later, he writes what you and I now have as the Easter story. He says, here's what happened. And if you'll allow me, I want to read the Easter story. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to stand right by the television because I want you to see these images. You look at the images, and if you want to follow along, you can. But I want to read the Easter story, so bear with me. I don't know if you, we, we read the Christmas account. I want to read the Easter account. Matthew chapter 27, begin at verse 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he could not drink it. And when they had crucified him... They divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were there crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Ela, Ela, Lema, Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hear and it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. 
There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the Mar- mother of Jesus and James and uh, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When, e- when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb when he had cut it in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imposter said he was, he was still alive. After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now watch the next nine verses. Chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And uh, for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you so. Now watch, watch. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. They were shaking, if you will. And they ran to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, I love this part. Can I just pause here for a moment? I mean, this to me is not, not necessarily hilarious, but can you imagine? I mean, Jesus can. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. <laughs> can you imagine what they did when they saw him? Well, they tell us. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Wow. That is the story of Jesus. That is the story of Easter. Here's what we know. The earth shook. Here's what we know. Tombs were open. Here's what we know. The centurions got it. As the blood of Christ fell, Jesus died. The earth shook, and now the church was scattered They're they're literally going out and and, and telling folks, he's alive, he's alive. The, the, The earthquake, literally, God changed eternity. Listen, God didn't do this quietly. He did this suddenly. He did this shockingly. He did this, is this a word? Shakingly. He didn't do this quietly. He wasn't like, shh. My son has died. He's in the grave. I'm going to bring him back to life at midnight. No, he did it with an earthquake. He split the rock. He shook the world. It was the announcement, my son has died, but also my son is alive. After the burial, you read it, I read it. The Jewish leaders approach Pilate and say, hey, just in case somebody steals the body, and we want this, this second hoax, right, stealing the body, to be worse than the first, the proposition that Jesus was the son of God. So it's like, aha, on them. we're going to prepare ourselves. Here's the resurrection. The resurrection happens. Again, the, 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 the tomb wasn't open so that Jesus could come out. The tomb was open so they could see that he's already out. So let's talk about Easter on the inside out. You know the story. You probably heard it a hundred times. Here's what was happening on Easter. On the inside, God was doing his work. We know that. To the rest of the world, Friday they were shook. Saturday, the world was motionless. It's as if they were shaken. But God on the inside was doing his work. Listen, listen to me, listen. At that moment when you don't think God is doing his work, he's always working on the inside of your life. You may not see it on the outside. You may have circumstances around you trying to manipulate, trying to maneuver, 
trying to master your emotions or manipulate the situation, but God is always on the inside. On the inside, God was doing his work. On the outside, man is, was trying to control events. The religious leaders and the, the Pharisees and the political leaders, they were trying to do whatever they could do, a good PR campaign to sort of damage control. And on the outside, they were working hard to cover this story up just in case this imposter, his body was stolen. On the inside of the tomb, God is writing his own story. On the outside, they're scripting a story. On the outside, they're coming together with the press releases. On the outside, they're saying, hey, just in case somebody steals his body, let's go ahead and get a story out there that will explain. They can say, oh, no, the tomb is still sealed. What happened was he was never really buried. Somebody stole his body. Let's make the second act funnier than the first act. Let's do that press release. But on the inside, God's writing his own story. This is the story of Easter. On the outside, the authorities are exerting their power. On the inside, God was flexing. Can I say that? On the inside, God was flexing. On the outside, they're saying, there's been a body and it's robbed. The body is robbed. On the inside, God was saying, there is no body that's robbed. Jesus, get up, go out, and walk around. <laughs> on the outside, they were trying to spread the news. His body's been stolen. But on the outside, God's going, walk around. Walk around. He was seen by over 500 people. A time out. We're still trying to control the story today. On the inside, God's doing something in your heart and your life. But on the outside, you're trying to exert authority. On the outside, God's trying to write a new story in your heart. But on the outside, you're trying to come up with a PR campaign that explains why you shouldn't or why you're doing the things you're doing. On the inside, God literally wants to move stone. The book of Ezekiel says God can come in and take our heart of stone and put in a heart of life. On the inside, God wants to take that heart of stone and he wants to roll it away and put in a new heart, a new heart of life. But on the outside, you're wanting to make sure that tomb, that heart is sealed. Like no story can get in. No one can touch me. I'm in, I'm in charge of my life. You see, we, like them, we're still trying to control the events on the outside. We're still, we're still trying to manipulate on the inside. We're saying, God, don't, don't move around. God, don't poke and prod. Don't go there. My life is fine where it's at. I just need to get a few of the things in order. That's on the outside. On the inside, God is absolutely trying to rewrite the story of your heart and the story of your life. So the story of Easter is, is this right here. You don't have to write your own story. You don't have to try to control the events of your life. Right now, you absolutely may be shook. You understand the conviction of God. You understand God is speaking to your life and your heart. Maybe right now, because of what we're living in right now, the uncertainty of the economy, the uncertainty of the ban release, the, the uncertainty of when we're going to be able to travel, the, the uncertainty of when are we going to be able to get back to life. It's normal. There are a whole lot of people that are living in anxiety right now. Listen, on the outside there may be anxiety, which there was at the tomb, but on the inside God wants to write a new story in your heart. On the inside God wants to write that story. Quit trying to control the story. Quit trying to manipulate and maneuver around the situation. Be like the disciples and run to the tomb and see that he is already alive, that that tomb is empty. You don't serve a Savior who is still in, a, in grave clothes. You serve a risen Savior. You seek out a risen Savior who is alive today. You don't have to write your own story. You don't have to manipulate things around your life. You don't have to try to roll the stone of hardness out of your own heart. God has already absolutely removed any and all obstacles preventing you from coming to him. The only person in your life that is preventing you from coming to Christ is you. Because you're still trying to write a story. The title of the message was How to Have Unshakable Faith. I can tell you how to have unshakable faith. When the world is shook, when on Saturday maybe your life just seems to be shaken, when, when life seems motionless, you literally need to come to Christ. You need to ser search out a risen Savior and be filled with two emotions at the same time, both fear 
and excitement, both fear and joy. The Bible says they were filled with full of fear and full of great joy. (laughs) This in no way, this illustration in no way encapsulates Easter, but can I? Have you ever been talked into riding a roller coaster you didn't want to ride? I mean, you were like, no, there's no way I'm going to do that. Majority of my girls love the roller coasters that go up real fast and come down real fast. And up real fast, and I'm like, no, I can do the hills, I can do this and that, but I'm not going to do this and that. There was a certain roller coaster here in the Orlando area that opened up a few years ago, and it literally, you lift out of your seat, there's not a whole lot of harnesses, and I'm like, nah, I used to be adventurous when I was 15, not now. And they're like, come on, Dad, just ride. Have you ever been talked into riding a roller coaster when you didn't want to? The whole time you're riding that, right? You're like, woohoo! Woohoo! I mean, you're like, I'm loving it, I'm hating it, I'm loving it, I'm hating it. That's exactly where they were. And then you're the first person when you get off the ride, you're like, that ride was awesome. I'm going to ride that ride 50 times. I'd do that. And everybody's going, "Uh uh-huh, you were chicken just five minutes ago. This, in some way, was close to Easter. They were absolutely shook. Life was taken out of them on Friday. Hope was not restored on Saturday. They had no idea how to view life until they went to the empty tomb. And they were both full of fear, like, is this real? And at the same time, excitement and joy. Your life can be shaking if you'll simply let the story of Jesus be your story and ask Him to come into your life. Seek Him like they sought Him coming to the tomb. Run to Him full of fear. Like, God, I don't know what this means. If I ask you into my life, I'm not sure I can live the Christian life. If I ask you in my life, I don't know how. I'm not a praying man. I don't read the Bible. I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not a going to church type of person. God, there's so much about coming to you that absolutely shakes me. But God, this I know. I need to be a part of a kingdom, a world, a system that isn't so easily shaken. Have we not seen just how fragile and how easily shaken our world is? But you and I know this from the Bible. It says the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ, that we now belong to a city, that one day we will go to a place, heaven, whose builder and maker is God. This is the kingdom I'm inviting you into. This is the story of Easter that needs to be your story. Whether you're watching us live or whether you watch us later, the invitation remains the same and here it is. The gospel message is simple. Do you believe there is a God who sent His Son, who died on the cross, was buried, is risen, and is now alive? That now there is a way for you to have a story of your life that matters beyond the term of your life. That you can have life in Christ. It's just that simple. You see, Jesus went through all of that so you and I could come to Him and skip that. We don't have to wonder and worry what about my next paycheck? What about my next? Th- what about what about death? What about? He's answered all of that. He's absolutely answered all of that. This morning, your world may have been shook a few weeks ago. You may be shaken. Like, what do I depend on? What do I look to? I'm praying this morning that, just like when somebody invited you to take a ride that you thought you never could. I'm inviting you to take a ride that you thought you never could. And that ride is to A, accept the gift of salvation offered by Christ. B, letter B, believe in your heart 
that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. And C, confess and commit your life to Christ. The simple ABCs of Easter. You too can have unshakable faith. That is my invitation. I want to lead you in a prayer of acceptance. Would you? So right now, I'm going to keep my eyes open. I want you to keep your eyes open right where you are. Pray this with me. I, I, literally, I want you to pray this with me. I want you to pray, Heavenly Father, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Receive me as your child. I don't want to write my story. I accept your story. With great fear and great excitement, I give you my life. In Jesus name that's the story of Easter if you prayed that prayer you need to let us know if you prayed that prayer let me know I pray today that you let God roll that stone away out of your heart let him put in you a new heart and give you a new story the story of Jesus can I pray with you can I pray over you Heavenly Father we come to you right now believing you confessing you Father, I pray that somebody out there today is, is, is no longer playing Easter, that they don't have Elmer's glue Jesus, they don't have camp Jesus, they don't have church Jesus, if you will, that they have a life-changing version of Jesus. God, that is our prayer that right now, Father, that right now someone would say, you're right, I've been writing my own story. And I can't keep up with the press releases. And that, Father, today they would abandon their story and adopt your story. The story of life and forgiveness and eternal life in you. May this be true for somebody's heart this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.